I can't say it enough. I, I'm naturally an optimist, if you know me a little bit, and so I always just believe the best and, and things are great. Um, but I'm really I am excited for 2024 of what God is going to do in the lives of people in this church and this community. Um, and I really do believe that 2024 is a year of increase. Um, I believe it's a year of salvation. I believe it's a year of revival. I believe it's a year of baptisms. Um, I believe it's a year where marriages are restored and renewed. Um, and I'm excited to share all the things that I feel like God has been downloading into my brain and my spirit over the last eight weeks. Um, but you'll have to wait. Uh, that was really just a promo for just an event we have coming up uh, just called Viva, which is our Vision Initiative Volunteer Appreciation. And uh, we want to appreciate the volunteers in this place that make this church so great. Um, but we also just want to share vision just for 2024. And so if if you've been coming to this church for a really long time, we really want you at this event. If you've been coming to this church for a little bit of time, we still want you there. If you're just walking in the doors right now, uh, we really want you. If you're watching online, we also want you at this event as we just kind of celebrate what God is doing and what he did in 2023 and then just some vision where we feel like God has placed in our hearts uh, for 2024. And there's going to be a lot of food there, okay? If, if you just needed that just to tie you over, uh, there'll be a lot of food there. There's no cost for it, but we need to know how much food and everything to be able to have. Um, I reason I don't want to share any of that until February, because I really believe this, and it's kind of just the title of the message, is how to live a life with purpose. You know, how to have a church with purpose, how, how to live a life for Jesus. I think it all begins with one thing, and it starts with prayer. It starts with pursuing him. It starts with seeking him. It's saying, God, I don't want, you know, my ways. God, I truly do want your ways. And so I really believe of just how to live a life of purpose really does begin with prayer. And so uh, I want to take a poll. How many of you honestly believe in the power of prayer? Just want to just do a little poll. All right, all right, that's good. Um, all right, let me ask you just one more question, all right? How many of you, even though you believe in the power of prayer, uh, believe that you could consistently, maybe a little bit more consistently this year, uh, and even and have even more faith as you pray this year? How many of you believe that? Like, all right, I can be more consistent, I can have more faith this year. Um, I think it's interesting that we could raise our hands for both, you know, it's, it's kind of funny to me. Uh, I, my hand was raised for that as well. Um, but why is it that followers of Jesus, that we have access to go boldly before God where no man has gone before and to be able to approach him and uh, that he hears our prayers and that he's moved by our faith, and yet so often our prayer life can be inconsistent it could be kind of haphazard, uh, and it's often, sometimes it just feels faithless in many ways when we pray. Why do I think that is? All right, just a couple of just theories, all right? I'll just give you a couple of my theories of why we think this way. Um, I think there's a lot of us, again, we're in this room, we love and we want to honor God, but we don't feel like we're good at praying. I mean, we just don't feel like we're good at it. Um, you know, sometimes I think we can have what's called prayer envy. You ever like been with someone and they just pray out loud and it's really, really good. And you're like, I'm not following that. I'm not going after that guy. Like, like this guy is a professional prayer or like, like sometimes I've been around those people, like, you know, Pastor Amber, I'm married to this lady and she'll pray. And I'm like, wow, God must be in heaven going, that was really good. That was really, really good. Um, I think sometimes another reason is that there's almost like this implied point system when we pray. Uh, like you get extra points if you use a Bible verse when you pray. Like for instance, if we just say, and God, we just ask you to come upon us as it says in your word in Isaiah 54, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. There's a, I mean, people who use the Bible as they pray, there's almost this point system. Like they just get extra points because they do that. And you may be in the room like, I don't know all the, the cool verses to pray. I don't know what to say. Um, or you get bonus points if you pray and you bind up the devil in Jesus' name. And you get people to go, mm, yes. And those are all points, 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 points. And you get people to amen you as you're praying. That's more points. Like there's this implied point system sometimes when we pray. But oftentimes I have felt like a prayer failure. I'm just not good at it. Like, I almost sometimes feel like I'm a pointless prayer. Um, 
that I don't have any good Bible verses, that I'm not getting any mm's or yeses, or, uh, and sometimes I just feel almost pointless before God as I pray. Some people just intimidate me and say, hey, you want to pray with me for like an hour or two hours? And I'd be like, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Um, I was just thinking we could just pray for like five minutes together, you know, and sometimes I feel those moments just being vulnerable with you. And, and honestly, there's times where I get very bored praying. Like, I'm bored. Like, I'm thinking, and, and I'm thinking that almost God must be bored as I'm praying because I'm just in you know, this old rut, and I'm just kind of just praying the same things, and I'm not making any sense of what I'm saying. And, like, maybe here's an example, all right? God, bless this food, this greasy cheeseburger and fries that I'm about to eat, which does take faith, by the way. Um, you know, I did a lot of traveling. We ate a lot of McDonald's. Um, or we prayed things like, you know, just something that's very predictable or safe or mundane. God, keep me safe today. God, be with me. Uh, God, help me to good, a good parking spot when I go to HEB this morning. You know, whatever it is, sometimes I wonder if the all-powerful God in heaven is looking down at us when we pray saying, is that it? You don't got any more? That's all you got? Like, you don't want to go a little bit deeper than that this year? And so I want to talk to you about what I just call the Christian adventure. I've been a Christian for 20 plus years of my life, and I can definitely say it's been the greatest adventure of my life. It has absolutely transformed my life. That I, I, There's moments that, yes, that are difficult to pray, but there's also moments that it's just exciting to pray, where I'm like, wow, God, we get to do this. We get to be a part of this. And I believe it's where we find the most exciting and purpose-filled life is when we pray. That in order to live the way that God intended, it starts with a couple things, with prayer and fasting. And uh, that second word is almost like a cuss word. I almost don't like saying it because I love food. And uh, what we want to do uh, in uh, this year, well, it says, I'm going to give you two verses and I'll tell you. Matthew 6, 5, Jesus is saying this, hey, when you pray, and he says later in verse 16, when you fast, not like if you pray or if you fast, like, hey, these are things I want you to do. These are things, disciplines that I want you to incorporate in your life because you need it more than you realize. God doesn't need our prayers. God doesn't need our fasting. You need that because it realigns us to saying, God, I can't do anything without you. But God, through you, all things are possible. Through you, I can do all things. And I want to realign my heart this year. And so I want to encourage you in 2024, this is your pastor speaking to you. Will you pray with me in 2024? Will you say, hey, I want to be a church that prays. I want to be a church that fasts. And uh, what we're going to do is in, in a few weeks, actually a couple weeks, I think we have a slide on the screen, is we are going to do a seven-day corporate fast. Where I want to encourage you as a church to let's say, hey, we are going to fast together. We are going to seek God. And for some of you, fasting is completely new. You maybe are not been exposed to it. I'm going to send an email out just to give a little bit of teaching. I didn't have enough time to be able to do that today. But I want to encourage you that let's just be a church that prays and fasts. And then we're going to end it on the 28th um, for a night of worship. If you don't know, Glad Tidings is one church with five different locations in the greater Austin area. And on that 28th, on that evening at 6 o'clock, uh, we are going to have an all-worship night. It is going to be a phenomenal night as the church comes together. I tell you what, when the people of God come together and they pray and they fast together and united in spirit, the miraculous takes place. And that's why we're going to end it on that uh, worship night. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Acts chapter Four. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to be in Acts 4 and 5 for the, like kind of the remainder of this morning, uh, so you don't have to do a lot of flipping. Um, I'm going to give you a little time to be able to find that. But while you're looking for Acts chapter 4, you can do it on your paper Bible, or you can load it up on your iPhone, whatever you like. Uh, I know some people have Android phones, which don't text me, you green bubble people, you. I'm just kidding. Uh, let me give you some context what's taking place taking place in Acts 4. Uh, Peter and John, they're preaching with great faith on the death 
and the resurrection of Jesus, and they're praying for miracles. And uh, there was a guy who was unable to walk for 40 years of his life, um, and, and Peter and John, they prayed for this guy, and God miraculously healed him, and he was able to walk. And the only problem was, is there's a group of people named the Sadducees and the captain of the temple guard and religious leaders that thought that Peter and John were trying to lead their own cult movement. And so these leaders arrested Peter and John and put them into prison. And the next day, they had to appear before trial. And the leaders uh, put them into prison. They put them into trial. And then they asked them this question. By what authority are you doing these miracles? By what power and by whose name have you done this? And so in verse 10, we get the response to that question. Like, hey, you just healed this person. How did that take place? Who gave you that authority? And this is his response. Peter responded in in Acts 4, verse 10, and he has this crazy boldness. He says, hey, let me state Or let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel, to everyone, okay? Like he's saying, hey, to everyone, I just want to be clear. I'm speaking to everyone in the house that this man, he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Now, let me tell you why this is an extremely bold statement, okay? Uh, This was bold beyond measure because basically Peter was saying this, hey, you killed this guy, but God raised him back. And the Sadducees, they didn't believe in resurrection, and so these were like fighting words. They were extremely upset, and because of his boldness, verse 13 says this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. All right. Um, These guys were amazed. All right. They were blown away that these regular, unschooled, ordinary guys were so bold. How many of you guys have like a, a PhD in theology? Or biblical interpretation. Okay, there's one. All right. Um, uh, I didn't know. I didn't know if there's anyone. Um, there's a lot of times where I feel like I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm not the sharpest tool in the tool shed. And here you have these guys. He says, "Hey, they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures." This scripture, this verse, is actually very funny to me uh, because the Greek word for ordinary is this word idiotas. Okay. True story, true story. It's called idiotus. I'm not sure why you laughed, um, but think about it with me. This word that can be translated to unschooled, ordinary, of no special value, or idiotus, can also be translated to an English word that you might be familiar with called idiot, okay? Um, They were blown away and amazed that these idiots who had nothing special about them But they were incredibly bold in their faith with Jesus. So suddenly, there's a little bit of a problem. I'll kind of just summarize this portion just for time. The religious leaders, they began to speculate, okay, hey, here we have this guy who couldn't walk for 40 years, but now he can walk. We can't really explain why or how this happened, um, but we can't acknowledge it either because we we were afraid that this Peter and John's movement is going to take over, so they attempt to shut them down, saying this. They say to them, hey, don't ever preach about Jesus. Stop doing these miracles however you are doing them, and if you talk about Jesus, we're going to arrest you, we're going to beat you, and if that's not worse, we're going to execute you in that order, and then don't talk about Jesus or you will physically pay. So what did Peter and John do? When they could potentially be beaten, when the threat of death was on the line, what did these two individuals do? They prayed. But let me tell you what these men did not pray for. They didn't pray, oh God, please keep us safe from these horrible, horrible people. Don't let anything bad happen to us. Um, God, all I want is a really nice job with a really good 401k. Um, I want to be happily married and just left alone. Um, I just want to go to my little small group and go to my little Christian group and and do my little Christian dance and do all my little things. I just want to be comfortable. Like, that's all I want. No, they didn't pray anything like that. Instead, they prayed with the threat of death, a very risky prayer. 
I love what one author, he says this, you know what? Following Jesus was never meant to be safe. Here's what they prayed in verse 29. It says, oh now, oh Lord, hear your threats. In other words, we know that uh, these guys plan to beat us and even kill us if we talk about Jesus. But he says, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Make me bold. God, make us bold. Give us unshakable conviction that we may have the courage and the faith to obey you no matter what the personal cost. God, even though it may be painful, make me bold. And all the religious leaders there were amazed by their boldness. So getting this far into it, I just have a question for you. For those of you that would say you're a follower of Jesus, how amazed are people by your boldness? How amazed are people by your boldness? Like, think about it. Like, if, if I were to put on the screen a scale of, like, 1 to 10, okay? Uh, 10 being, like, super, super bold and 0, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, super, super timid, like, whatever you want. Um, like, where would you be at on that scale, on that scale of 1 to 10? How amazed are people by your boldness of your faith? Some of you in this room, you're a little modest, okay? Uh, you might say, well, I'm kind of like a 7, maybe an 8. But if we, were, if we were to really be true to you and, and who you are, you're probably more like a 9 or a 10 because everyone who knows you knows where you stand in life, uh, that you have been transformed by the grace of Jesus, that you have this spiritual fruit in all that you do. Sometimes you speak up publicly and other times you don't even need to because even just your presence in the room, people are changed by the way that you live and by the way that you act. They can see the goodness of God in your life because the eyes, the Bible says, is the window to our soul. Everybody who knows you, whether they agree or not, they know that you are a committed disciple of Christ. You're a follower of Jesus and so you're like, I'm an 8 or 9 or maybe a 10. There's other of us, uh, others of us in the room, if we're honest, we might say, you know what, Pastor, I am a Christian, but I don't really talk about it that much. I don't ever really share my faith. I'm probably more like or two or a three. Uh, you might be the one where you work with someone for three or four years, and they find out you're a Christian, and they kind of freak out. They're like, oh, my goodness, you're a Christian? I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea you were a Christian. We've been working in the same office for like four years. What church do you go to? You go to Glad Tidings too? <laughs> what campus do you go to? I go to Glad Tidings. You know, there is, what they're saying is basically there is no fruit, there is no evidence that shows that you are ever a disciple of Jesus, you ever gave your life to him. I love the verse in Acts 4.13, when they saw Peter and John, these people said this, they also recognized that these men had been with Jesus. They could just tell, like there was something just different about them. Like I, I, every time I read this verse, I pray that, I'm like, God, hey, people see Jesus in me. Without me even saying a word, without me like pulling out my Bible and saying, hey, let me share something with you. No, may they just see by the way that I act and my countenance and my attitude and the way that I love people, may they just see Jesus in me. God, may I be your hand extended. The question for you is how amazed are people by your boldness? I want to look again at this very bold prayer and just show you what God did in Acts again 4, verse 29. Peter and John, they prayed this prayer in the middle of their threats for their life. And they say in verse 29, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, say that out loud with me. After this prayer, ooh, that was, that was okay, say it one more time. After this prayer, one more time, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they preached the word of God with boldness. Here's what I love. After, it was after this prayer that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they preached the word of God boldly. You may say, all right, pastor, that's all fine and good, but I'm just not a real bold person, okay? Like, I'm 
I'm kind of more quiet. I'm a little bit more timid. I'm kind of reserved. I'm not very public about my faith. Okay, listen, from a biblical sense, boldness is not a personality trait, okay? Like my personality, I'm extroverted. If you didn't know, I'm extroverted. But I'm also very shy, and you like, you're lying up there. No, I'm really shy. The last thing that I want to do is be standing where I am. I would rather be sitting there and have someone else speak. I don't like to speak in public. I don't like to speak in front of people. God bullied me up here, okay? And I just had to say yes, okay? Um, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can be naturally quiet, and suddenly you have spiritual courage, and boldness can come out as a result of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not a personality trait. It's the work of the Spirit in you. What I love about these guys that prayed is the Spirit came, and they preached with boldness. They didn't, like, pull out their AirPods and, and do their favorite, like, pump-up music, like, <laughs> he's like, whoa, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting all pumped up for the Holy Spirit. I'm getting ready. I'm getting, I'm getting all the boldness inside of me. No, they, they didn't do that. They prayed, and they preached with boldness. Now, I want to caution you that when you pray a prayer like this, this simply, God, make me bold, you will see opportunities to be bold in ways you've never seen before, okay? And you might be thinking, like, oh, my goodness, like, what are you saying? Like, am I going to have to give a speech at work? And when I pull up the PowerPoint, I show, like, you know, all the executives, like, okay, hey, this is what we're going to do. And here's some, some new stats and new figures. I don't know what you guys do. So um, here's my PowerPoint. And then your last slide. Okay, hey, if you didn't give your life to Jesus yet, I want to show you how to do it. Uh, just follow my diagram of how you can get saved. Like, am I going to have to do that? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, that's probably not the best idea. There's innumerable ways that the Holy Spirit can prompt you to be bold. Let me give you some examples. You may just be having a conversation with someone, and suddenly you feel the urge of, hey, can I, do you mind if I just pray with you? Like, do you mind if I just pray with you? And you're not really comfortable praying out loud. And so uh, the next thing you know, you're calling heaven down, and you're believing for faith for God to move and touch this person and bring healing right in front of them. You may be in a meeting, and someone does something very inappropriate, and you very lovingly and appropriately say, hey, um, let's not do this. Guys, we're, we're better than this. Like, and you might just be bold. You might be bold when everyone is just gossiping and against someone, and they're trash-talking someone in the office, and so you don't participate, or you decide just to walk away, or even bolder yet, you kind of say, hey, guys, again, we're, we're, bolder. We're, we're better than this. We can do better than this, and you might be so bold. You might be bold by dressing modestly in a culture that doesn't really dress that modest. You might be bold enough to say, you know, I'm not hooking with every single person I see. I mean, I may, this is not my thing, and that's not my lifestyle, what I want to do. And so you're saying, hey, I just, I'm saving myself, and you might be so bold. You may see someone hurting and say, hey, I'm going to bring you to church with me this week. I'm going to bring you to church with me this week. I'm not just inviting you, I'm bringing you. And there's a difference between bringing and inviting. Some of us, we, we've been kind of good, we've been inviting people, but there's a difference when we say, hey, I'm bringing you to church this week. You're going to come with me to church this week. I'm, I'll pick you up or, hey, I'll, I'll save a seat for you. I got a free coffee and I got it for you. You can tell them that you paid for it and, and it's fine. I don't know. That's probably lying. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, there's so many ways that God might manifest himself through the power of the Holy Spirit when you just have the courage to say, God, make me bold. What would happen if just every day this week you set an alarm before you go to class, or before you go to work, before you get in your car, before you do whatever, whatever you do, that just for a few moments, you just say, God, make me bold today. God, may you make me bold today. May I have the faith to believe that you'll show up and do, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. God, make me bold. Peter and John, in the very midst of a very real persecution, kept on preaching about Jesus, kept on watching God do miracles, kept on seeing people get saved. And the high priest and the religious leader said this, we're going to do, we're going to stop you. 
And in Acts 5, 18, it says they arrested the apostles. They put them in the public jail and put an angel of the Lord, but an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then he said to them, go to the temple and give the people this message. Basically saying, hey, it's time to go to work, all right? If you want to live with purpose in 2024 like never before, it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. So let me just show you real quickly just three attributes of what I believe takes place when you pray for boldness, all right? This is the first one. I'm going to tell you it's not that fun. Look at your neighbor. This is not fun, okay? Uh, Number one is this. Boldness almost always triggers spiritual opposition. Boldness almost always triggers spiritual opposition. Peter and John continue to preach boldly uh, that Jesus had been risen from the dead. And then they say, then it says in verse 18, they arrested the disciples and they put them in a public jail. This is the second time in, like, second time in one week they're in prison. All right? That's not a good, like, reputation, okay? Two times in one week they're put in jail. And a lot of times people say this, oh, my goodness, like, I'm, I'm trying to live for Jesus, but things aren't going well. Everything's wrong. Like, I'm trying so hard to, like, live for Jesus, but everything is just going wrong. Listen, serving Jesus is not a formula for everything going perfectly in your life, okay? Uh, whenever you serve him faithfully, there's always spiritual opposition. In fact, I don't worry when there's opposition for my obedience, I worry when there's none, because maybe, just perhaps, I'm not being obedient. If you pray, make me bold, the Spirit of God will come upon you, and you will find yourself standing up for the power and the name of Jesus, and it may not go well for you. Doesn't that sound great? Sign me up. People may make fun of you. They may laugh at you. They may talk behind your back. You may not get invited to all the parties or get-togethers. You may be passed over for the promotion, but this is spiritual opposition. The bottom line is this. If you're not ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you may not be ready to be used by God. They go hand in hand. Make me bold. Boldness often triggers spiritual opposition. All right, the second thing is really exciting, all right? Look at your neighbor. This is exciting, okay? That's good. Very, very good. All right, this is exciting. Boldness often releases miracles. All right, that's exciting. Boldness often releases miracles. In other words, when you live bold faith, you will see the hand of God move miraculously in and around you, okay? Um, I want you to see this in Acts 5, 19. And again, this is, when I look at this verse, I think it's funny. And I hope you find it as funny as I do, because I think it's rather hilarious. But Peter and John are in the prison, for the second time that week. And Luke, he's the one that's documenting all this. He's the one writing the book of Acts. He's he's writing all this. And it's not just what he says. It's how he says it that makes it funny, okay? Um, So verse 19. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Read it again. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. There's no exclamation point okay? There's no exclamation point. Nothing like, oh my goodness, you're never going to believe what happened. Like these guys are in prison, and then all of a sudden like an angel of the Lord just came and opened it up, and everyone, and they got out, and it was just unbelievable. Like none of that. There was no excitement as like, there's no exclamation point. The exclamation points, like those are infallible to me, all right? Like nothing like, hey, listen to this. You got you to gotta hear this. Like These guys were in jail, and an angel showed up, and it was 10 feet tall, and it was blazing fire, and the the angel had a sword the size of a Honda Accord. Like, none of that. None of those descriptive words. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the jails, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. Listen, if an angel of the Lord shows up behind me, take a picture. (laughs) All right? I'm going to tell everybody about it. I'm going to put it online. I'm going to talk about it and say, this is amazing. But Luke just says this. Hey, you know what? These guys were praying. They were preaching. They went into prison. And an angel of the Lord showed up and opened the doors. Okay? In other words, this. When you're walking in obedience to God, you're not surprised by opposition. 
but you're also not surprised by the miracles of God. Like, isn't that incredible? Um, He just shows up. He is just faithful. When you start praying, God, make me bold, and the next thing you are bold, suddenly the power of God is in your life, and you're able to do things and see things that you've never done before in 2024. You may pray out loud for the very first time. I didn't grow up like that. I never prayed out loud. And you don't even know how to pray. You're nervous. And suddenly you're praying with faith. You're praying with faith. Someone might ask you a question as you're sharing your faith, and you don't know what to say. I I can't call Amber right now. I don't know. I don't have the answers to this. And suddenly a verse pops in your brain. It just, just pops in your head, and it seemed that it came out of nowhere. And you're like, man, where did that come from? There's so many times that I'm talking with some of you, and, and I feel like God put something in my heart, and I say it. And as soon as I say it, I don't even remember it because I'm like, wow, that was really good. I'm not really that great. I'm not really that smart. Some of you will come to me and say, wow, Pastor, that was so good. I'm just an ordinary guy. Idiotus, okay? That's me. <laughs> Uh, that's who I am, all right? Uh, When you walk in obedience to God, you will not be surprised by the miracles of God. Bold obedience often triggers the faithfulness and miraculous power of God. All right, third thing, we run out of time, is this. No matter what, boldness always requires faith. Boldness always requires faith. When you pray, make me bold, I promise you this week, you are going to have to live by faith in ways you probably haven't in a long time. The angel said this to Peter and John in uh, verse 20, chapter 5, says, go to the temple and give the people this message. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, and as they were told, and immediately began teaching. What the angels essentially said hey, do the very same thing that got you arrested twice, okay? Do that very same thing. Keep on doing that. And the thing that almost got you killed, keep doing that thing. It's going to take faith. Make me bold. Watch as the Spirit prompts you to do something that's going to take faith because you don't know what God might set into motion through a single act of bold obedience. You have no idea what God's going to do. When you pray, make me bold, he might step in when everyone else steps out. Or you might show a generous expression of love in a way that might have made you feel uncomfortable before. Oh, you may not see it in a moment, but you'll never know what God might set into motion through one single act of bold obedience. Here's the great news. Let me finish the story of Peter and John so you know kind of what happened. So they prayed, make us bold, and they served Jesus faithfully. You want to know how God blessed them? Can I share you just how God blessed them and how God rewarded them? I'll tell you what happened. So Peter, he ended up marrying his high school sweetheart. Uh, And 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 they were just so excited. John, he did the same thing. He met with a gal online, and they fell equally in love. They had weddings at a Jerusalem chapel, and and it was wonderful. They took amazing Instagram photos. Uh, Paul took his bride to Jamaica, uh, while John, he took his bride to the Bahamas. They had the absolute best honeymoon. They came back because they were best friends. And because of the resurrection and and the wave of all the healings taking place, they decided to start a consulting business. And it was a huge success. Like, they had unbelievable success. The money was coming in like crazy. And they lived such a comfortable life. In the early 50s, they sold their business and retired in the mountains. And they raised their grandkids and lived happily ever after. Because when you're boldly obedient to Jesus, your life always gets better. Right? Let me tell you what really happened to Peter and John. Who prayed for boldness and who were incredibly bold for Jesus. Contemporary historians tell us that John, he was arrested And he was dipped in boiling oil. It was designed to kill him because, well, it pretty much killed almost everyone else that they put in the oil. But somehow he lived through the torture and he was exiled and excommunicated to the island of Patmos, where he spent the rest of his life alone. 
Peter, we know from first century sources that he was martyred in Rome. And according to tradition, he was crucified. And he says, hey, I can't be crucified the same way that Jesus was. Will you please turn me upside down? Not worthy to die in the same way as my Lord and Savior. That was his reward for bold obedience. To live a life with purpose. It always starts with prayer. But praying bold prayers is dangerous because obedience and boldness almost always trigger spiritual opposition. So don't worry when you face opposition for your obedience and boldness to God. Worry when you don't. How amazed are people by your boldness? If you know Jesus like I know him, if you've been forgiven like I have been forgiven, you want to be bold. You want that light to shine. You don't care if you face opposition because you want others to know the freedom and the grace available through God's Son, Jesus. So what would happen if you prayed this week, God, make me bold? Before you finish your goal list for 2024, what could God do in you this year? What could God do through you this year? So Father, I just pray for a church full of Jesus followers, bold and courageous in their faith. That God, with no one looking around, I'm just gonna ask that in the next seven days, between now and when we see you back to church, because we're gonna see you here next weekend, because you don't wanna miss what God is doing. You don't wanna miss being in the presence of God's people. But between now and that time, I'm curious as to how many of you will pray this prayer daily. Put a reminder on your phone before you walk out of the apartment or the house. Don't raise your hand because you feel obligated or you want to impress somebody or you want to raise your hand out of guilt. But raise your hand out of passion that you want God to make you bold. If you'll pray with me just for the next seven days and let's just see what God will do. Well, will you just lift up your hands right now all over the place? God, make me bold. God, make me bold. God, I thank you so much for people who over the next seven days or even just a remainder of their life, that God, we will pray for a spirit of boldness. That Holy Spirit, would you come upon us and would we not be weird or annoying, but bold, but appropriately and loving and full of grace, standing up for the name, the name that is above every name. God, I thank you that over the next seven days, we will see time and time again when you prompt us, God, empowered by your spirit to represent the glory, the goodness of your son, Jesus. Make us bold. And as you keep on praying right now this morning in your seats, I know there's some of you, if we could just talk plainly, that you could look up at me and you say, hey, pastor, on that scale of one to ten, I'm probably, I'm probably more on the lower end. And I just want to ask you, do you really know the grace of Jesus? Do you know the grace of Jesus? Have you experienced his forgiveness? Because when you do, it's really hard to keep it to yourself. Maybe for some of you, you grew up going to church and you have all this head knowledge, but it's not a heart knowledge. And some of you, you recognize, that's me. Some of you, you, you come, you're in church, but you're not engaged in following Jesus. I know we just came out of Christmas season, but I love the question, who is Jesus? Because Peter and John, they explain it very simply, saying he's the son of God. He was without sin, and he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And God raised him from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave. That anyone who calls on his name, the name that is above all other names, that your sins would be forgiven. Your life would be made new, and the old is gone. You are new. You're not a better version of yourself. You're different. You're new. It's why New Year's resolutions don't work because you're still the same person. But with Jesus, you're new. You are filled with the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You will never, ever be the same. You belong to God, and you are in His family. And some of you in the house may say, that's not me. So here's what I want you to do today. In the words of a great man that we just did his funeral yesterday, we're going to fix that. 
I want you to be able to boldly say, I need Jesus. Let me say something Jesus said. If you confess me publicly, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you are embarrassed of me, ashamed of me, if you won't confess me, I'm not going to confess you. If you follow Jesus, you follow Jesus. And a lot of times you do it publicly. So for anyone in here today that says, Pastor, I need his grace. I need his mercy. I need his forgiveness. Today, I'm turning away from my sins, and I want to follow Jesus today. I don't care who's watching. By faith, I give my life to him boldly at this moment. Jesus, save me. Make me new. I give you my life. If that's your prayer, I want you to boldly lift your hands up in the air with everyone looking, saying, God, I want to live for you. I want to boldly live for you today, Jesus. You are the King of kings. God, you are the Lord of lords. You are everything to me. Dear Heavenly Father, you see the hands in this place. God, we want to be a people that pursues you. God, we want to be a people. Make us bold. God, help us to do it lovingly. Help us to do it appropriately. God, may we want to live a life of purpose, and may that start always is with prayer. Help us to pursue that this week. Remind us this week. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just before we exit, I just wanted to share with you the last two couple things. If, uh, if you're new to this place, there's a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you. Man, make sure you fill that out, and you can, again, can drop it right before you exit. If you maybe just say, hey, I want to take a next step in my boldness. I want to get baptized. Um, or, hey, Pastor, I just gave my life to Jesus. Will you tell me about next steps? If you could just fill that in that Connect card and just put that in there, again, right before you exit, I'd love just to connect with you. Or you can come up front here and talk with Pastor Amber or uh, uh, Savannah or myself. We would love just to be able to talk with you after service. Um, but last two things is we really want to get people in the Word of God this year. And uh, there is a, we have partnered with the Version Bible app, which is the most downloaded app in the history of the world is this app. And we partnered with them, so you will find our church directly on that app. Um, if you want, you can scan that QR code, and it will help you find it immediately. If you don't have that app downloaded, again, you can scan that QR code. Uh, but we have uh, different Bible plans to help you get in through the Word of God that we suggested out to you. One is about prayer and fasting. Another one is just a, a 365-day devotional to get you in the Word of God to read the entire Bible in one year. All right, I'm going to have you just stand to your feet. Look at your neighbor and just say, let's be bold. Let's be bold. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you this week for small groups, guys. Have a great week.